You? Uh, Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. Cool. You're doing a lot of a lot of teaching online, right? You told the last couple of. Yeah, it's it's been. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, teaching classes. I've taught a lot online over the years, but mm -hmm. this, it's strange to be teaching courses yeah. online. You know, but mm -hmm. we gotta gotta do what we can right now. You know, so. Sure. But yeah, you're uh, using the Zoom. Yeah, using yeah. Zoom. Oh. Yeah, and then you know, I mean, for the audio stuff, I have like. We're not, I know you didn't want to use all this stuff, but I have like a lot of, you know, pro microphones and things mm -hmm. that make the audio like really good. At least they can hear it and hear me play instead of, you know, uh, instead of the computer speakers where you play and it sounds all distorted and you know, yeah. trying to, trying to display tone to a student and it sounds terrible. Mm -hmm. so, what's, what's the best setup that you discovered for, for the bass clarinet? Um, well, uh, I mean, these, you know, um, this thing, you know, these mics, uh, where the hell is it? There we go. Yeah, what's that? It's an AKG 414. Uh -huh. uh, two of those on a bass clarinet sounds great. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can't, for this application, it's great. But for live stuff, you can't, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they catch everything. So they don't, they don't work well for actual, if I'm playing with a band. But, yeah. you know, for this teaching stuff, then. Mm -hmm. um, great cool cool uh well long story short i when i prepared for the interviews i just was aware of a lot of names i was googling i was checking my facebook connections and actually in my case how i got introduced to you was i found a clip where you were playing the bass clarinet i think it was uh, recording an album with fred hirsch oh yeah so that caught my attention oh great yeah fred's wonderful you always had the love for the low for the low notes for low uh frequencies yeah uh, you know i started off playing t uh i mean when i was a real when i was really young i played alto sax and then when i was i guess how old was i 14 i switched to tenor sax mm -hmm. and then i i got really serious with music early so i was i was playing professionally when i was 14 and then i mm -hmm. started playing with uh, I guess famous bands when I was like 15, 16 and touring and doing that stuff. And mm -hmm. I ended up playing with uh, some Motown legends, the Temptations and the Four Tops. And mm -hmm. they ended up wherever we went, they could easily find tenor saxophonists. But the problem was, was getting a really good baritone saxophonist. So they knew that I was already playing baritone. So they said, ended up telling me, you know, would you be interested in playing baritone in the band? <laughs> but we'll give you all the solos that you would normally have on tenor. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, sure. So then I, I basically switched to baritone for that. And then mm -hmm. it just felt, uh, it felt right, you know, and then bass clarinet as well. Uh, when I, the second I started playing that instrument, it felt right. And really, to be honest, I was struggling on clarinet forever. Mm -hmm. It just, it was one of those instruments that when I started playing, I could just never get the sound that I heard, you know, I would hear this, these all these players with amazing tone and even though i was practicing and i never it never clicked it never it never felt right so then when i when i started getting serious bass with bass clarinet it was just immediate i fell in love with it immediately mm -hmm. so, so so you came from the barry sax to the bass clarinet yeah and uh, low uh, I, I see a flute there low flutes as well or low flute yeah i play uh, i guess nowadays yeah i alto sat i mean alto flute is uh -huh. kind of my main flute uh and that same thing it just the lower frequencies uh, -huh. uh just appeal to me more right uh -huh. and they just i just like it they just resonate more and i play a lot of bass flute too uh mm -hmm. bass flutes hard because playing it live you have to have the microphone so loud that mm -hmm. for it to go through the band that it's kind of it's pretty tough mm -hmm. that's that's one of the hard things about Mm -hmm. uh, about bass flute so alto flute carries more so it's easier to to play mm -hmm. live mm -hmm. you know, but and being able to play all those instruments you're you're playing uh uh musicals and broadway shows and things like that or big band uh jobs as well yeah i used to i used to do a lot of broadway and then i guess how long i guess about six or seven years ago after doing a bunch of shows, it was it wasn't very fulfilling for me. I think as an artist, I realized that 
I was I was competent on every instrument, whether it was bassoon, oboe, piccolo, all these instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, I was I was playing at a professional level, but I wasn't necessarily reaching the artistic level that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And and I could see myself in the future, say, looking 30 years ahead and I would be having a, I would have a real solid life, but it would it seemed kind of boring. And so, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, for some people, it's great. But for me, it was I really wanted to play these instruments uh the way i i was hearing and not being stuck playing the same music every night mm -hmm. and i don't know if you've done a musical or done stuff but i did some shows where you know for over a year where we played eight shows a week and you play the same music and i started going nuts because mm -hmm. i want to improvise and i want to have even with the audience i want to have some you know connection to them and when you're playing pit gigs you're you know under the stage essentially and mm -hmm. it's just anyone could be doing it and it, yeah. it's so so I quit I quit doing that and then now I've been utilizing all these instruments with a bunch of different bands. Luckily, I think now people um ask me to play these instruments cuz they're unusual and then they hear it somehow and then mm -hmm. and then ask me to play in their bands and like you said big bands, different recording sessions and mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff, but as a leader I've I've definitely used all of the instruments mm -hmm. and that's kind of helped get that uh that timbre out there where people know what it sounds like mm -hmm. and get interested. Like maybe I could use this on my album. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Do you use a, I didn't look that attentively. Do you play a bass player into low C or, or a small one to low E flat? Uh, I, I have both. Uh, so I, you know, when I was sometimes some, some gigs, as you know, as a clarinetist, some gigs, a lot of gigs nowadays, you have to have the low C. And so I, I play a low C when when I have to, but okay. when I'm when I'm playing stuff I want to play, it's it's I'm gonna be play, I'm playing my low E flat. Mm -hmm. it just it just sound it, to me it's uh, it's more agile. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it has more of the voice that I hear in my head. So mm -hmm. for that reason, I always and I I, I don't know I've I, you know I've gone back and forth and even done uh, tests with friends. Like, can you hear a difference? You know. Mm -hmm. as, you, and generally, everyone says the same thing, and which was the the E flat sounds uh, kind of livelier, kind of more present. Where the the low C has has a gorgeous sound, but it's it's more subdued. So yeah. for a, a soloist, I always and and I got to say too, traveling and touring, it's much easier with an E flat. It's just yeah. that little amount of space because I usually have three instruments at least. So any any you know small uh, decrease in in uh, you know the airplane issues is is worth it. <laughs> yeah, everything has to fit into the hand luggage, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's as you know. Uh, How do you do that? I mean, because I remember, I remember once I had, I have, I don't know what 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 kind of case it is for my low E flat bass player, but I remember putting there a t shirt. The microphone was already attached, and I mean, sometimes you have to be really. I mean, oh, the yeah. underwear was stuffed in the bells and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah. How do yeah. you do when you have to take the flute and the uh, and the baritone? Is there a special case for you? There? Yeah. So I have I have a system that I've had to come up with over the years, uh, which is my baritone goes under the plane in an anvil in an anvil mm -hmm. case, and then I have the uh, the baritones. The baritone is in a, uh, in a soft in a gig bag inside of an anvil case. So whatever location I get to, then I I have another case for it, mm -hmm. and it's you know it's it barely fit it's it's under it's under the weight you know it has to be uh 50 under 50 pounds mm -hmm. otherwise you get charged mm -hmm. a crazy amount and i can't even keep the mouthpiece or the neck in the case so i have to put that in a backpack and it comes up at 49.5 pounds <laughs> so every time it's it's uh mm -hmm. you know you cross your fingers but it's yeah. And then, and then I take the the bass clarinet never goes under the plane because of the temp temperature issues, mm -hmm. uh, so that goes in the overhead. And then my one my flute I take in my backpack. So I usually have a backpack with, you know, mouthpieces and and reeds and mm -hmm. and that's about it. And then you know the flute and then the bass clarinet. So mm -hmm. everything else goes under the plane. Yeah, you mentioned uh, I I didn't understand. Uh, you have a hard case like for. for Putting the baritone into, into yeah. The so the I have a um, there's it's like it's a touring case, so it's okay. huge. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's made by a company called Calzone, which is mm -hmm. 
just they just make a lot of they make like military grade cases mm -hmm. for touring and traveling and then in in you have two options you can put the instrument right in the case where it's like a form fitting case and the instrument goes in there and what i chose to do was was have the instrument inside of a of a gig bag and then that goes inside the, that case mm -hmm. so it's kind of like double protection mm -hmm. and it's uh, it has a little leeway so it doesn't just it can absorb more of the the hits and mm -hmm. so it's you know and i and i've traveled a lot internationally and usually like knock on wood usually it's okay mm -hmm. but i've i've had uh i've had issues with that where i've you know been in you know wherever it is uh, you know germany and trying to find a a repair guy it, you know get off the plane so it happens it's just part yeah. of it yeah. yeah and when it comes to playing uh bass clarinet um do you uh did you take lessons or you yourself taught and you're trying to make the switch from one instrument to the next to bring out the char characteristic sound or or uh yeah. playing wise yeah so i took i took clarinet lessons mm -hmm. on uh, soprano clarinet and i have never I've actually never had a lesson. Uh, I've never had a technique uh, lesson on hmm. bass clarinet. I've had some improvisation lessons with uh, with people that I was studying with on all my instruments. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I would. I guess I'm self taught on on bass clarinet in that way. Uh, mm -hmm. It's you know, I, I when I got serious, I got really serious with bass clarinet about 20 years ago, and I knew the things that had made me. Uh, competent on on the other instruments on saxophone especially so i just started working you know out of the charlie parker omni book mm -hmm. uh, i i transcribed a tremendous amount of lester young um i you know was playing a lot of songs in all keys mm -hmm. so i would go through and whether it was cherokee or whether it was you know, all the things you are whatever the standards were i put it through all the all the keys mm -hmm. on the instrument just just to get technical facility mm -hmm. and that that seemed to help a lot and yeah. and you know a lot of it um one of one of my favorite teachers ever was was bob brookmeyer the the great composer and valve trombonist mm -hmm. he he told me you know same time about 20 years ago he he said uh he, he asked me he said how are you planning on using some of these instruments because i was telling him i loved you know bass flute for instance and he kind of mm -hmm. laughed and he's like no one's going to ever ask you to play bass flute. So how are you going to play it? And, uh, and I just, I said, then I said, well, I'm, I guess I better write some music for it and just for my own bands. And he said, yeah. And he, and he said, yeah, that's the only way you're going to get this to happen. So mm -hmm. just write a lot of music for these instruments. So I, so at the same time, I started writing for my own band, writing a lot of melodies and things that would feature the bass clarinet. Mm -hmm. And that really forced me to, to get together a, a lot of a lot of technique and mm -hmm. and develop my own sound mm -hmm. again this is beautiful that it that that it happened with you as well i heard other uh, uh guests doing those interviews that by writing you have finally the chance to to write and what you eventually want to hear and uh so you can i mean you know which notes are sounding better than the others on the bass client for example so you can write uh what what fits best for for the instrument i guess yeah it's true and it's yeah that that really changed things for me because you you know professionally there's a lot of people have come across my work from from me playing these instruments and just you know googling whether it's contra alto clarinet or some mm -hmm. different stuff where uh i don't think there would have been a way for me to get into the industry without having you're right i mean having composed music for these specifically for these instruments mm -hmm. and and then like you said there's and the, the other part is there's no one to blame if things go wrong except yourself mm -hmm. so when things don't work then yeah you better better realize you know how to mm -hmm. change that and, and what to do and mm -hmm. as you know as a clarinetist yourself the the versatility of clarinet is is incredible and the different different sounds that you get in each range are, mm -hmm. are drastic and on bass clarinet that's I really find that too, where, you know, writing in the middle, the top versus the bottom and the, mm -hmm. it's, there's so many different colors to explore. So that's mm -hmm. been, been wonderful to learn. Yeah. yeah. Do you also find that somehow for me, uh, the bass clarinet has 
just naturally almost already so much jazz inside it's 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 that the roughness and that warmth everything is already there so i i felt yeah. somehow it's it's much easier to kind of jazzy away with that instrument than with with others with right them. yeah i i think i think you're right and for me some of the stuff that i've really found that was i guess it's uh you know, partly I think when I pick up a B flat clarinet, uh, I should say a soprano clarinet, when I pick that up and I start playing it, I hear, you know, Paquito and Eddie Daniels and just, you know, everyone that came before, I hear all these legends and I hear their sounds on the instrument. But when I pick up bass clarinet, we basically all started with Dolphy. You know, you, you hear Eric Dolphy. But other than that, it seems wide open as to what the instrument can sound like. Yeah. And for me, that was, it's it's liberating because there's no uh, set sound as to how the instrument is supposed to go. Mm -hmm. And so you don't, for me, I didn't have the, this preconceived idea of, of what my tone should be necessarily. I have the reference of Dolphy, but then that's it. And it, that's totally different than like tenor sax for me. When I, you know, when I'm playing a tenor, mm -hmm. I, there's 200 at least legends that I hear mm -hmm. that I know that I, you know, that, that I'm kind of, I don't want to say competing against, but, that my my ear is fighting to either get that sound or get away from it and bass mm -hmm. clarinet it was just it's like where do we want to go what mm -hmm. what sound do you want to work on and that mm -hmm. that's been uh really interesting yeah you know, just, just to have this this open palette and just see where it goes yeah it's, it sets things free totally yeah, yeah. and yeah. You, you majored uh on which instrument you studied music uh uh i guess yeah, so I did. Um, I did a bachelor's mm -hmm. on uh, on saxophone. Uh, just it was basically classical, but it had jazz studies too. Mm -hmm. And then I did. Uh, I did a, a master's in in jazz saxophone. Uh, and but when I did that, I that was at New England Conservatory, and I uh, I also did a master's in jazz composition at the same time. Mm -hmm. So when I went in, I was playing all the instruments. So I was playing bass clarinet in ensembles uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's it. Not So I wasn't, I didn't want to be a doubler, you know, where I go in and I play mm -hmm. saxophone 90% of the time and then I pick up a flute and play it. So I, mm -hmm. I wanted it to be at least like 50, 50 where I'm playing all these, all these instruments. So mm -hmm. I did that. And then I did a PhD at, at Rutgers, but that, that was in classical composition. Mm -hmm. And so that, and my reason for doing that was to, to learn about stuff that I just to be more exposed with the the real tradition of of classical composition, mm -hmm. and to and to write different uh, concertos and different things that feature these instruments. So I'm I'm actually writing. A, I did I wrote a concerto for um, for baritone, uh, right. which which I recorded, which turned out well. And now I'm doing a uh, writing a concerto for bass clarinet. So mm -hmm. just just trying to keep all this stuff together. And mm -hmm. yeah, you know, but. Um, I think I think playing on Broadway and, and learning the instrument, it's there's a lot of uh, there's so much we can learn out of books and things that, that, you know, they don't have. I don't know, maybe in Russia. I think there might be some places now that have jazz clarinet majors, but most places don't. And I and I I had to really fight just to get the and people would hear me and then they would allow it. But mm -hmm. Most people didn't want to, a lot of places I would say didn't want the, the clarinet. It was like, oh, you're a saxophone. It's great. Great. And then I pull out an alto flute and they're like, what the hell, what are you doing with that? What, what's, you know, so yeah. we kind of have to make our own, make our own way. Yeah. That's a good point that you mentioned that it's, it's true. It's to major in jazz clarinet. It's something exotic still at most places. I, I'm aware of, I think Germany and um, Holland maybe. Okay. Where there are some chairs, but I don't know how many students actually are there doing that. But right. I think it's it should be the next step to, I mean, for example, those interviews I'm doing also in love for the clarinet. And I think the same should be true for for being able to study jazz clarinet as, as, as silly as it may sound. But uh, it, I think it's it's definitely something that it's like majoring on jazz flute. It's also not that common, I guess. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It definitely should happen in the future. Yeah, it should. And hopefully it will. I know there's, 
I've certainly seen an increase. I'm sure you have. You're probably interviewing a lot of really amazing musicians. So it's there's been in the last 20 years a huge increase of the amount of players that are playing clarinet very well and and flute. It's which is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Any any uh, mentors uh, you had as a teenager that invited you, invited you to gigs to play or to recommend you recommend yeah, you? I, yeah, you know there was. Uh, one of my, one of my best friends still is is a man named Frank Perry and I was a pretty wild kid and when I found jazz when I was 12 he he introduced me to bird and he he taught me to improvise and he you know he had me I think by the time I was 13 or 14 I was going I was subbing for him at his jazz gigs and so he would he would ask me to to come in and play and and I feel bad looking back for some of the, you know, the regulars in his band that were, you know, older gentlemen that were very good. And then here comes this kid that knows like five songs uh, and takes way too many choruses on every solo. Uh, but he, but he really, he gave me the first major chance for me to explore the music. And he's actually a fantastic doubler himself. Mm -hmm. And he, he plays flute incredibly well. Uh, so he was very inspirational and I had an, I've had a bunch, but there was uh, a friend of mine who passed away named Rico Mordente, who was another person who mm -hmm. really helped me. Um, and then current, you know, the current people that are still around that are uh, really important in my life is George Garzon on saxophone. Mm -hmm. He's been a, a huge mentor and mm -hmm. a Jerry Berganzi. And then in the classical world, I have uh, uh, Robert Aldri Aldridge, who's um, Bob Aldridge is, an, an amazing composer and he's he actually produced with me the last two albums uh and you know he he's helped me kind of break uh, i guess i want to say break down some of the barriers that are supposedly there between classical and jazz mm -hmm. and so he was someone that's you know a grammy winning opera composer mm -hmm. and then he comes in and he's working with this large chamber orchestra where we're playing jazz and it's great to have someone like that that's in there that's also aware of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the orchestration on a different level than me. So, uh, there, I've been very fortunate. There's been a lot of mentors in my life mm -hmm. that have that have helped me tremendously, and and that's, you know, and that that always and that goes into every recording session I do. I always try to get the the most incredible musicians possible. And uh, the last record I did with Fred Hirsch, and it was. Uh, it's amazing working with him and hearing him uh, bring this music to life was was incredible. Yeah, yeah. Tell tell us a bit about that if you if you can. Uh, myself, I'm a huge huge fan of his delicate voicings and everything so tastefully played. Yeah. And uh, I'm aware long time. So how did that happen? You just ringed him up and said if you in, if he's in the mood to play some. <laughs> yeah. Well, we uh, we were both professors at Rutgers together. And so I would see him around and we would, we would talk about things. And he, uh, I, I mentioned to him several years ago that I wanted to make a record with him. And mm -hmm. you know how many times people say that and you just, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, great, great. Talk to me when you're ready. Uh, so I, when I was putting this together, I, I contacted him and asked, I said, Fred, would you be interested? And he's, you know, he's so, uh, he was familiar with my music, but he's, even even then, he's such a perfectionist. He said, you know, I want to hear the music first. So can you tell me what, what you're going to be doing? Uh -huh. And I, I said, well, I can, but I haven't written any of it yet. And he said, well, when's the, when's the date? You know, when are we recording? And I said, it's about four months away. And I gave him the dates. And he said, okay, so you're going to write all the music? And I said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he said, okay, well, uh, send me the music when you have it. He mm -hmm. said, okay. So I... Uh, I wrote all the music in about a month, I guess it was. And uh, I wrote, I wrote a lot of it on every, on the record. I play, I play baritone sax, mm -hmm. alto flute, C flute and bass clarinet. Mm -hmm. And every song that I'm, uh, that I'm playing, uh, whatever instrument I'm playing on those, on that song is the, is the instrument that I wrote the song on, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So when I, when I wrote the music, I, I sent it to Fred and said, let me know what you think. And he said, yeah, it's great. Let's do it. So after that, we, we got together Drew Gress, and, uh, which I had never worked with Drew, who's an amazing bass player. Uh, so he's the only person I hadn't worked with. 
and I said, I want to get Billy Hart on the drums and because I've worked a lot with Billy. And those three have played together a lot over the years. They actually have a trio that's that's worked together for 15 years at least, maybe longer. Okay. So so they were all together. Then we got uh, Mike Rodriguez on trumpet. Mm -hmm. And I had booked all those those people before I wrote all the music. But after I wrote the music, I talked to... Uh, I had two producers, Bob Aldridge, who I already mentioned, and then Herschel Garfine, who's another Grammy winning uh, orchestra, jazz also, but also uh, classical Grammy winners, amazing, amazing writers, mm -hmm. both of them. Uh, and I told him after I wrote the music, I said, the, I said, the thing is, you guys is actually, I, I want strings on this. I'm hearing, I'm hearing strings on, on, on mm -hmm. this stuff. And they both were kind of surprised and, you know, they've, they've known that I've, I've used strings on several of my records, but uh, it was cutting it close time-wise. And they said, well, uh, okay, you know, let's see how it goes. And so I, then I arranged all the string parts and then uh, gave them to Bob Aldridge and then he, he orchestrated them as well. He kind of, you know, took some of them and rearranged them and made them even better, which was wonderful. And uh, I got all the fantastic string players and, we went in and we recorded the whole record in two days. Uh, we did one day where it was just the, the quintet. And then the next day we did it with the, the quintet plus strings. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it worked out really, really well. Uh, the, the music is, you know, I, I the older I'm getting the, and I, I've been like this for a while, but I don't, I don't want my music to be uh, technically virtuosic. I'm not really interested in that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where, I want it to be, um, I guess I'd say emotionally virtuosic, if that makes sense, instead mm -hmm. of technically. Sure. And that's where Fred Hirsch comes in. Uh, yeah. I, I think Fred's similar mind where he plays one chord and it's just like, oh, oh my God, what just, wow. Yeah. And so when playing with him and playing with everyone, it was just very easy because mm -hmm. anything I play, Fred makes sound better. And hearing how he took the melodies that I wrote and he just made them his own. And uh, it was, it was really amazing uh, to, to bring this stuff to life. And, and it was, you know, most, most of the music was one take. Uh, and it was, it just, it just came off uh, really well. And that was, and that's some of the stuff, even the, the title track for now is on bass clarinet mm -hmm. and, Bass clarinet really, I think, is more of my voice than anything now. And I, I still love playing baritone, but uh, bass clarinet, I think, is actually what I what I prefer. That's I hear that much more. It's just the organic uh, mm -hmm. sound of it is is uh, you know. And by the way, I, I heard some of your stuff. It was fantastic. That that um, I can't remember what the raga, the name of the raga was that I heard was uh outstanding the drummer and the what was the instrument not zither what was it yeah it was a russian uh, goosley called. okay that was yeah. great yeah yeah we nice. call it just raga yeah it's, it's, a, it's a nice trance trance like song yeah right it sounded really fun to play too yeah, yeah. yeah it is it is it is yeah and i guess having the chance to rec record with masters around you it, they take the sheet and they just made music out of it, not just playing the dots on the paper. So I, it's. Well, definitely. you know, that, that's something that, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. First of all, anything you give them, they're going to make better. And that's something I've learned too, is that I, I don't, uh, you, I'm, my goal is to, to write music where they, they have to look at the page obviously and see what it is for guidance. But then mm -hmm. I want them to be able to do their own thing and not not be completely buried in the music. And I yeah. know, as you know, we've all we've all played music that's so difficult where, you know, it's it's shifting from seven, eight to three, eight to two, four to 15, eight. And you're you're literally staring at the music going one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one. And while that's going on, uh, the music suffers because it's not internalized. And so I my goal on this is to take pretty much to have lead sheets for everyone. And here's, here's the chart. Here's the melody. Here's the bass notes. Here's the harmony. Do your thing. Mm -hmm. And so to give them freedom and especially someone like Fred Hirsch, the worst thing that I could do is, is tie him down to, you know, here's the voicings you're going to play. How, you know, 
So I, I tried to give them as much freedom as possible mm -hmm. so they could take the music and really do their own thing. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, uh, something that I've found more and more important over the years now. And, mm -hmm. and that's from me being a side man too, going into the studio where, where I'm doing what I just said to you, where I'm staring at the page and, mm -hmm. Uh, I can't even really pay attention to what's going on because it, my part is so hard and I don't want to mess it up. Mm. So that's, and someone like Billy Hart on the drums, he's, he's a one of a kind musician because uh, when he goes in to a session and I have to say, I think he's the only person I've ever heard do this, but when he goes in, if you, if you do a take and it sounds really good uh, and then you do another take it, most musicians will do the, the first take uh, and then if it worked, they'll do the second take and they'll they'll basically play something similar to what they did on the first take, but even kind of fine tune it, you know, OK, that worked well, but mm -hmm. I'm going to change this part right here. Mm -hmm. Billy has this this incredible philosophy that when he each track is totally different. So mm -hmm. we go in and we do one track and he may play be playing this halftime swing feel. And then the next time he's he's doing like a double time feel mm -hmm. and to the point where it just it keeps it so fresh. And that's that's something that uh, I recorded with him for the first time, I guess, about 13 years, something like that ago. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked because I'm so used to the other way around where yeah. you know, we got something that worked. Let's just kind of keep going. And he's just like a wild man. He comes in and is just let's try this thing, you know, let's just do, you know, I'm totally mm -hmm. different. And what that does to the studio is, is makes everyone just on their toes and everyone is just, you know, real. it's very exciting. It's, it's like a lightning bolt goes in every time because you never know which direction it's going to go in. And that just, that was very, that's always very helpful to have him in there. Speaking of approach, do you have a special one when it came, when it comes to practicing the bass clarinet, do you try to figure out things that you would like to play or you just, try to be natural or is there a process going on? There's, there's a lot of techniques that I, that I practice that mm -hmm. I, uh, that I work on diligently and try to, uh, try to, you know, fine tune so that when I'm in the studio, I just let all of that go and then just see what happens naturally. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's a lot of things such as, you know, on bass clarinet, for instance, the, the range is so wide. Mm -hmm. that a lot of things that I'll give you like one thing that I worked on a lot over the years is that playing, playing the song with uh, take giant steps, for instance, you, you take a song with a lot of chord changes mm -hmm. and instead of on each change, uh, literally changing directions on the instrument, you know, where it's like you're marking each, you know, boba, doba, 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 you know, mm -hmm. I, I try to take it from the bottom of the instrument and just continue a line all the way up. So it's, mm -hmm all the way to the top, maybe high G or A flat or B, mm -hmm. whatever I get to, and then come down the same way where I just keep the directions the same. So I don't, so I'm not um, marking each chord change with, mm -hmm. with also changing a direction in my, in my improv. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, that's been helpful just to kind of build uh, all the connections on the instrument through the whole range. Cause it's, mm -hmm. it has such a wide range as you know, uh, that to be able to utilize the whole thing fluidly, that was something that was helpful to me to just kind of break break up the yeah. the tendency to to be choppy, you know. And yeah. I have I was gonna I don't know if I have it here, you know. I have sheets that that I keep in my I don't know, I guess it's in my case right now. I have these little sheets that I keep everywhere where uh, you know of stuff that I'm working on. Uh -huh. There it is, uh, and then I and I keep tempo markings on it. So whatever it is, you know, like I was working on diminished, improvising using diminished scales, and I was keeping the, you know, the tempo of how, how of how well I could do it with, you know, whether it was triplets or quintuplets, and I keep the the tempo log, so I, you know, I could do it at one twenty perfectly, and then the next day I'll try to do one twenty five, and mm -hmm. and then if I can't, then I'll slow it down to one twelve or something. So I I try to be really. Um, organized with my practicing mm -hmm. so that I can, I can master things. Cause I, I, that's a problem that I find that I find in my own practicing, but also many of my students now is that they'll practice the hell out of one thing for a couple days. Mm 
mm-hmm. and then they move on and then they go to something else and practice it. And, and the result is you don't really get, you don't master anything. Mm-hmm. So it's, if you take something as simple as, uh, you know, a diminished scale, for instance, if you practice that for weeks, it's different tempos, uh, different time signatures, then you can actually get that integrated into your playing. Yeah. And we don't, I don't have the, the intellectual intellectual skills to be able to think about a lot of the stuff that I'm going to play. I can't, you know, at the, at the same time when I'm playing something, I'm not thinking, okay, no, I'm going to surround that F sharp by three half steps. Here we go. And that worked out perfectly. Now I'm going to, you know, it just, it just has to come out. So the only way to get it is, is that motor memory that, that yeah. we build by just intense practicing. That's, that's yeah. very organized. Yeah. But I guess the beautiful thing is that because you're, limiting yourself your attention to something specific and work on it develop it so so uh clean that makes you at the end to relax and just play and don't think anymore like you just i think that's the ultimate goal that you're going for then yeah absolutely and you know something i started doing in the studio uh, i i practice this too and i i work on this uh but it's it's too uh it's too intense for me to practice all the time. So uh, I, I kind of hold out for when I really want to make, make a, make something strong, make a, like a, you know, do something important. Oh, here's my, the sheet. I just, it's on the floor. Great. Um, here's by the way. So here's like the little one thing that I do where I have, you know, I keep little checks Definitely. on the little, you know, whatever the scales are. And then I have, you know, an alto flute thing on this side and, mm-hmm. You know, that's for instance. But anyways, yeah, uh, one thing that I do um, when I'm in the studio is is I, I think words to my solos mm-hmm. and I try to start off every solo like that uh, where I'm I'm thinking uh, whatever the song is about. Like, for for instance, a lot of the music on this record, this, I guess every record of mine is, is about love, uh, about in, so, in some capacity where that's for someone, for uh, for our world, whatever it is, whatever I'm thinking about a friend, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. uh, I actually start thinking the words of something that I would want to say to this person or say about this, this situation. Mm -hmm. And, and I try to only play one note for each syllable. So it's like, I'm talking. Yeah. And what that does is that stops me from overplaying It, it really, and it forces, um, it forces the 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 subject to be meaningful to me it kind of gets it gets rid of a lot of the the technical issues of uh let me hear you know i'm going to play this fast this is going to it just gets rid of all the nonsense yeah. it gets to actual what the message is about mm-hmm. and so i i stay on that for as long as i can and usually at some point i will i will switch into where i'm just hearing the colors and whatnot but it's that's something that's uh that i've just taken away from Mm-hmm. playing playing standards and singing the melodies in my head singing the lyrics in my head when i'm playing mm-hmm. and so you know after doing that on songs like body and soul and really amazing songs with great lyrics it's it makes it so much more meaningful and so mm-hmm. that that's something that i tell my students to do and we i have some exercises for students to do mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's amazing because it it just stops the uh, the patterns and you know the different things that we yeah. all all our uh, cliches that we've all built up over the years it just mm-hmm. gets rid of that mm-hmm. you just you wow. can't do that yeah. wow, that's such, such a uh, beautiful approach i never heard about um about that i am just aware of people who are learning the lyrics to standards before they play it so they can make more sense yeah. out of the melody but if i'm not if i understood correctly you're would even play that way when you would play one of my songs, you would try to play the ly- lyrics right away, even if it has no lyrics, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, that's, you know, there was a, um, a, a thing that I started doing years ago, and I, I did this actually, this, I, I talked about this, uh, Bob Brookmeyer, we were talking about playing lyrics, mm-hmm. and he was, he asked me, there was a song I wrote, and he said, what's, you know, what is this song about? And I told him, I said, there's lyrics to it, and he said, well, are you going to have a singer? And I said, no. And he said, well, then why are there lyrics kind of thing? And, and then he, and then he said, Oh, wait, he said, Oh, because you want to have the, the heart connection. And I said, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. And after we talked about that, I ended up 
trying to figure out ways to to have people explore this and i found that you have to you have to pick a really something uh it sounds very serious and it is but i i always tell my students i want you to to write down a sentence of something mm -hmm. that you would die for what what is something you would literally die for mm -hmm. and everyone looks at me like man i just want to play jazz this is too serious you know mm -hmm. uh, and everyone kind of looks and thinks and and generally most people as you would imagine it's family mm -hmm. uh, you know it's family it's a it's a, a social cause it's 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 the weighty issues of life it's not hey check out this 251 lick mm -hmm. at all right i mean it's uh so i have them write that down and then i tell them to i want you to sing that melody in your head while you're playing mm -hmm. and don't worry about what your fingers are doing at all For, i start with no no i don't tell them what key i don't mm -hmm. tell them what scale i just just play Mm -hmm. think that melody and play and usually it's pretty shocking because they play and you feel it it's just immediately whatever they play it's like oh mm -hmm. wow okay you know and then if they if they stick to it and i say keep repeating that that it's like a mantra just keep repeating that sentence and mm -hmm. see what happens and if they do you know you can hear the syllables of their sentence and, and it's and it's heartfelt and immediately when they get away from it and they forget to do it you can hear it it's like there's a disconnect all of a sudden in the music where it goes to like, oh, wow, that was a nice little lick, you know. Mm -hmm. So after seeing that over the years, that, that just just reinforced it. And mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah, it's I, I recommend people trying it because, it, yeah. it you know, a lot of the uh, one of my favorite teachers, another a, a great guitarist named Clint Strong. He said uh, he said too many chops is a, is a dangerous thing. <laughs> you always say that sure. and it's true and it's you yeah. know you get too many chops and it's you just want to use them it's like yeah. here check this out yeah uh and so yeah. i always think of him saying that man too many chops yeah. so, well i should receive my homework so i will definitely try that out <laughs> all right let me know hit me up yeah. let me know how it works the lyrics it's beautiful yeah i mean i think that's what i'm referring to when i'm asking if somebody had lessons or is self-taught because it's just my opinion that somehow that people who are self-taught, you know, they are just somehow fresher in the approach. They are not, they didn't spend with uh, too much, too many years with all those books that are available about yep. with licks and patterns and what to play and what not to play. They just, right. go, they just go and play and somehow it can be a very, a very natural thing. And I, I think your advice, um, is going into that direction that even if you have education, you can try to find what is the sentence that you would say in a soul. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, you know, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. And something that, uh, I guess, I don't want to say it's shocking. I guess it, it's, it's obvious because to most people, but still, I think it was surprising to me when I, when I first moved to New York and you go to a jam session mm -hmm. and there's just, you know, there's a line of people waiting to get up for their for their five choruses or whatever it is. And every person that that's there can play really well. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no lack of technical virtuosity at mm -hmm. all. You know, and even even these young kids that are 18, 19 that are in these jazz programs at Juilliard in Manhattan or wherever mm -hmm. it is, are playing technically very well. The thing that they don't have, most of them don't have yet is is something to say. Mm -hmm. And in I don't think it's that they don't have something to say. They're just not saying it. Mm -hmm. And that so that's it's been it's been a big influence on my life where I'm not I'm not the um I'm not the guy that you should call for the most technological or I should say uh most awe inspiring virtuosic technical statement that's that's mm. not really what i've focused on mm. but i know that the reason i've worked and i've uh i've played a lot is because i i try not to do that i try to mm. only play the notes that i think need to be played and mm. and it's it's just it's a different approach and you know i'm sure i've lost out on a lot of work because of that but they there's plenty of great players that can do that stuff mm. so that's just something now that i i really uh you know, we, we are the competition side of things. You go and you go, to, you go to smalls uh, and or this, you know, these great jazz clubs and, you know, soloist after soloist is just going, you know, 
And every time I go up and when I'm there with friends uh, or where if I hardly go to them anymore, I don't want it, but I'll go up and I'll just play the root. I'll just hold out the root. I'll just go Va, and wait for the band to actually stop doing their. And usually I, I've had, I've had the whole band fall apart over me holding out the root. I mean, mm. it's like the most amazing thing you just play. And I play it like a mezzo piano. Mm. And so everyone in the, everyone there is, stops playing you know usually the piano player stops playing immediately because they're like what the hell is this guy doing mm. and then the the bass player will look and uh, you, know, you know all of a sudden everyone kind of gets quiet and the, yeah. we reset and then we can make music yeah but it's like getting it out of that frantic like you know here we go check out this lick i just worked on today i got it up at 350 bpm check it out yeah getting rid of that Going away from the competition to more to make music at yeah right it's, it's like, let's all have a conversation here. You know, I'm not going to play over you. Let's play together. Mm -hmm. Let's listen to each other. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's another thing with the uh, jazz education right now is uh, at the university that I'm teaching at right now, I just started at this new school and a lot of the students wow. practiced with um, iReal Pro and uh, the app. And I I don't want them to at all. I feel like that's training people to not, listen to what's going on yeah. and they it's better to not practice with anyone except a metronome and just yeah. to practice so then when you're with someone else you actually listen to them yeah I can't, I, see, I can't see all those phones on the bandstand anymore it's making me oh. a little crazy yeah. Uh, yeah yeah it's just stop stop that mm -hmm. it's it's a strange thing but that's once again that stops people from listening and actually paying attention to what's going on mm -hmm. how was your approach uh how do you deal with uh like the volume that is cannot compete with the trombone or trumpet when you play the bass clarinet is to um, try to make make your bodies to listen or you amplify the bass clarinet so so that you don't have any problems I, that's that's a great question y usually if i if i'm in a situation like i was just talking about where i go to a jam session mm -hmm. and i'm playing bass clarinet um I'm proactive in how I, if I don't know the musicians at all, that's, which is generally the, you know, if you go to a session, wherever, whatever city it is or what, I, I will physically turn around and face them and make eye contact with them and play an open G or whatever is closest mm -hmm. to the, the key center and the, whatever song we're, we're playing. No. So I should say G or A flat generally, and that'll work, you know, one of them will usually. And so I'll turn around and look at them and kind of be staring at them. Mm -hmm. And so they look up at me and then realize, oh, my bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to listen, mm -hmm. you know, because I think the, the approach that I used to take when I was when I was a kid was like, oh, yeah, I can do this and just ha mm -hmm. and try to blow my guts out. Yeah. And generally it doesn't work for many reasons. And one of the main reason that was because of what we were just talking about, where now I, I've gotten into this uh, machismo like uh, competition instead of music. Mm -hmm. So usually I just try to address it right out the gate and just kind of look at people and I don't, you don't have to say anything, mm -hmm. just play super quiet or I'll play really quiet mm -hmm. and then, you know, and turn around and look at them and then everyone usually will, yeah. and as you know, the drummer is the leader of the band generally. So if the drummer's just like, ding, 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 you know, and then you turn around and look at him or her and then she's like, oh, got it. And then goes quiet and goes to a hi-hat or something. Then it's like, okay, then now we can make music. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it really, in some situations with my own groups and other, if I'm playing in a band and I know they're going to be amplified out of the nature of what the music is, is, if we're playing some kind of, you know, groove-based music, some kind of backbeat something, then yeah, I have a, uh, I have a, a microphone system that, um, that I use. And so, uh, you know, the AMT microphones, two mics, I have a bell mic, and then I have the mic cup for the keys. And then, you know, then I can do anything I want. Yeah. Uh, and that's realistically now that's, I use that a lot uh, mm -hmm. or I'll, I have different microphone options so mm -hmm. that I can use mm -hmm. because I want to be comfortable and I don't want to have to blast. And sometimes the music does have to be loud. It just needs to be. Yeah. So uh, it's better, it's better to acknowledge it and know and know how we're, how to handle it than just mm -hmm. be, it's it's not a, it's not a good feeling when you're having to play as loud as you possibly can and you still weren't heard so the you know on tour i always travel with my own my own gear my own microphones just to make sure that that it's handled right so i, I will be able to be heard yeah
Yeah, it's so important for that instrument, I, I think, because uh, yep. otherwise it changes the way you play just to make sure to be heard. But that's not the reason why you're why you're there at the end. Yeah. 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 So, so in closing, Brian, what what's next for you? What are you working on? Uh, what are you looking forward to? Is there are you doing some live streams at Smalls or something like that? I, in the I think in two months I will be. Yeah. Uh, but you know I think everyone's kind of up in the air, and mm -hmm. I haven't really. I've had a lot of friends which have done really well by by doing all the the live stream thing. Mm -hmm. I you know I haven't really been doing that. Uh, out of it was kind of strange to release an album and then not and because yeah. this this latest album came out on may 15th mm -hmm. and during the in the middle of all this and we decided to put it out anyways and i'm glad i did but mm -hmm. it's it's been uh it's been interesting kind of just sitting back watching and it's yeah. it's been getting a lot of pr uh, airplay and whatnot but mm -hmm. uh you know i'm just looking forward to the next thing and getting back to some mm -hmm. regular life whenever that happens mm -hmm. yeah uh, the next the next thing for me is i'm going to record a, a big band album mm -hmm. and uh, i will i'll be featuring bass clarinet on probably half of it uh, and Perfect. you know that's that's the next large project and then after that i'm going to do another small project i usually kind of alternate um you know small ensemble large ensemble back and forth so i think that's that's the next plan for me and just to improve just continue to improve and i'm excited i just got a, just found a book that i bought a long time ago so mm -hmm. so i'm just gonna work on some new new concepts so cool. how about you what have you been what's your next plan well my plan at the moment is doing those interviews and having the chance to talk to people like you and to be inspired by what the, what they're doing and uh so so i'm this is my learning process at the moment by by staying well, home yeah yeah, yeah. Good for you. It's smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, looking forward to to hear that uh, the next project of yours. Uh, you, I, I'm sure you will uh, compose and arrange when you're talking about big band, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I guess we can find that on your website to be up to date. It will be. Yeah, it'll be on there. Cool. Well, it was a pleasure to talk to you, Brian. Thank you, Simon, for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for that, and uh, see you around. Okay. See you soon. Thank you very much, Brian. A pleasure. Take care. Bye. Bye.